Hello, this is Dr. Lorenzo Norris, Editor-in-Chief of MD Edge Psychiatry. Today, we're privileged to have with us uh, Dr. Hawk, who's going to be talking about, to us about um, physicians and mental illness and the structural barriers to disclosure. Um, this, uh, I'm going to encourage everybody to uh, read the article that Dr. Hawk uh, recently came out with because it is, it, in my humble opinion, it is very timely, it's very meaningful, and these are discussions that we need to be having. So please stay with us as we talk with Dr. Hawk about, if you will, the double stigma that physicians face and how we're going to start to work about our different ways we can think about to get through this so that physicians can get the uh, help that they need. Dr. Hawk, welcome to the Sitecast. Thank you so much, Dr. Norris. Really appreciate the chance to, to engage with you and your audience. I'm a, a psychiatrist and uh, uh, social scientist and philosopher, and I, uh, I'm really interested in this topic. I um, have training in social sciences and bioethics, and I've done a lot of work on uh, disability law and disability bioethics, as well as um, uh, the culture of medicine and, and how uh, medical culture can be dehumanizing. So I got interested in this question uh, just to understand a little more deeply uh, things that I've seen in my colleagues, uh, in my patients, um, throughout my own training, feeling uh, the stresses of just being a clinician. And uh, I wanted to sort of bring some attention to the, to the drastic underdisclosure amongst uh, physicians who are struggling with disability in general, mental disability in particular, major depressive disorder as well. So Dr. Hawk, I got to tell you, um... I read this and I really, I was so glad that our editor, uh, Gina Henderson, uh, recommended and thought like, you know, we need to have a site cast on this. Now we've, we've talked about wellness, burnout, and depression on the site cast in different, uh, at different episodes at various times. Where we're at right now, particularly by the time this site cast drops, um, Wherever you're at in the country, you're either hopefully a, a good percentage of your uh, population or your group is starting to, your, your physician group is uh, vaccinated. You may have differing levels of vaccinations in your community. I wanna say at the recording of this site cast, 20 million uh, percent of the US population is vaccinated. With that being said, at this phase of the pandemic, people are even under more stress um, they are tired, they are exhausted, and we know that mental health issues are going to start to come to the forefront. They already have, but we definitely know that. So I think that this is a very timely thing as we enter into this next phase of the pandemic and talking about physicians and how they can start to think about ways in which they can get help uh, for themselves so that they can support their patients and their community. But Dr. Hawk, before we do that, you have you had a really interesting background. I mean, you had a lot of different things combined to give to help give a focus on this. Can you just tell us just a little bit about how you decided to combine all these different things to uh, really start to look at, for lack of a better word, the culture of medicine? Uh, sure thing. Yeah, I'm I'm somebody who kind of is a, a philosopher who wound up becoming a doctor. I, mm. I kind of started in philosophy and theology. I went to divinity school, and I I um I really started. And, and kind of backed my way into medicine. I never really enjoyed medical school. I thought um, uh, I even I even didn't do a residency at first. I went back and did uh, training, and did my PhD and other things. So then I came back to it because I missed taking care of patients. But I I, I kind of um, used those experiences to inform some of the things I study, like um, uh, the culture of medicine and dehumanization and how um, uh, the way we construct our patients and ourselves can impact how, how we flourish or don't flourish and how the kind of care we give our patients uh, manifests. And um, I guess I, I try to just avoid any departmental labels and just look at a problem and see any kind of mm. tools that might be able to be brought to bear on the question. Okay, well, that's what I'm talking about. Um, so Dr. Hogg, with that, now that we, we all have a little bit of understanding about Dr. Hawk's uh, background, one of the things in your article that we talk about, uh, that you talk, I should say you talk about Dr. Hawk, is the challenges that physicians uh, have when they are considering disclosing, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, that they have a, a disability. And maybe you could start to talk about um, what do you think needs to happen so that we can have a culture of medicine that would facilitate more disclosure by physicians that mm. are suffering and that would actually qualify for a disability? Absolutely. Um, and, and just to, for some of your listeners who may not know how bad the problem is, um, only about 1% of, of medical students with a major depressive disorder will disclose it as a disability. 
So um, you can cons- just, just think of that. These are people who go into medicine who are, you know, if you look at your college class and remember it, mm-hmm. these are, the, these are the, the people who are incredibly resilient compared to the average college student. So amongst those people, only 1% will disclose uh, their dis- major depressive disorder. So in some ways they're rational actors who are considering the culture and the institutions around them to not be conducive to the, the benefit of disclosure. They will rather forego treatment and care and accommodations that are ne- necessary, legal, and ethical, rather than um, face the consequences of doing that. Um, and, and I think it's a big part of why there's high rates of depression and suicide amongst this population of people who are generally very conscientious, hardworking, resilient, um, emotionally regulated, and just to even get to where they are. I, I can only imagine how bad it would be amongst the general population if, um, if we took a, a very random sample. And um, I think. It's something that's not often talked about, but it is uh, great at getting more attention because we have, of course, a duty to care for those mm-hmm. who care for other people. Uh, but we also have an ethical obligation uh, to our patients, to the, all the doctors that get lost, who don't enter the profession, who don't retain themselves in the profession, um, uh, who don't use their good experiences of, of working through suffering to you know, share the understanding and empathy they might have with our patients. and um, the health of our, our physicians matter in a way. I remember once when I was in, in, in my training, I offered to do a, uh, uh, we had to do a research project and I offered to, to test uh, well-being interventions on mm-hmm. the, 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 the physicians. And it wasn't even approved as a necessary quality improvement program. And I thought, well, why is that not even considered mm-hmm. <laughs> worthy of quality improvements? So that's kind of a cultural thing. And um, of course, the therapeutic alliance is all about being present and being there with your patient. But if we're not there, we can't give good care. Um, so, and then and, and all of those factors really, I think are, are necessary to this culture issue. Uh, but to answer your question more directly, I think there's a, a culture of ableism, the idea mm-hmm. that uh, if you're disabled in some way, uh, you should leave the profession, mm-hmm. that um, accommodations are sort of special treatment as opposed to equal, equal um, equality in the, the playing field, that accessible education is not as rigorous in some way. Um, there's also the idea that uh, our default condition in our institutions, as well as in the culture at large, is um, uh, invulnerability, imperturbability, as opposed to the human reality that our default condition is vulnerability. So if we build our institutions around the idea that we're all supposed to be invulnerable, you get a whole different set of problems. Um, so I think that's a, that's a big part of the culture. Um, the administrators tend to expect stoic struggle and linear lives. And the students tend to all, you know, the students and us ourselves, we tend to have perfectionistic personalities. We equate moral worth with our professional progress. We uh, think of help seeking as a weakness. Uh, by nature, clinicians are agreeable people. They're more interested in helping others than helping themselves. These, these, all these factors blend into this problem of the vulnerability, uh, the construction of vulnerability in our culture. Then there's, um, I think, the ableism I mentioned. The third factor is the idea of uh, becoming a doctor as a competitive enterprise as opposed to a cooperative enterprise, mm-hmm. uh, a shared enterprise that we, we have inter- interdependence as opposed to independence about. And our product, uh, a fourth variable I think is our, our productivity it tends to be valued more than our, our moral status and our moral, our moral behaviors towards each other. Um, um, and I think those are the things that come to mind, but there's so many others. There's so many others, and I, you, you gave us so much just to, to, to chew on there. So much to chew on there. Let's just kind of like unpack that a bit. I'm going to start with the idea of the invulnerability because you do a masterful job in the article of really talking about from start at like just the admissions all the way through our training, all the way through fellowship, and I dare say particularly for those early career attendings, um, how mm-hmm. this this. But we are, in certain ways, we recruit for a certain level of invulnerability. And why? Because saying you're invulnerable seems a little bit like kind of like, you know, gosh, are these docs grandiose or whatever or something like that? But but this is where I think it comes from. It's what you said, that stoicism. So that mm. stoicism and being able to take or deal with what whatever may come or, you know what, we like when people would applaud or clap for the doctors in the midst of the pandemic. And you, many of you might have been in institutions or places where heroes work here or something of that nature. It 
talks about that ability to serve regardless. As a matter of fact, we talk about in physicians, the idea of it being selfless. But the other thing mm-hmm. that you brought up, particularly in my role, people who are uh, listeners of the Sitecast know that I'm also a dean in the School of Medicine. Mm-hmm. So when you said silent competition, I just literally almost jumped up. I was like, that's it. Dr. Hawk has it, silent competition, because no one's actually, at this day and age, I mean, in a lot of places, people aren't going to talk outright about the uh, the competition, but silent competition is absolutely, definitely just there and prevalent. And we just went through, for those who are not aware, the uh, match. So again, whether or not you were thinking about competition or not, um, we have like flashpoints in medicine where silent competition definitely, 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 definitely Mm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. comes out. And so you take all of that. And I wanted you to expand just a little bit more on this because I I personally Mm -hmm. find this quite a bit. The idea of when you, for for physicians, the idea of being told that, or even considering the idea of taking a leave as just absolutely something that is going to make the problem potentially worse, depending on who you're speaking to. Absolutely, uh, Dr. Norris. uh, I think what you mentioned is really on point. Uh, we, we, we tend to think our moral worth is, is related to our professional status or, or competence. Mm-hmm. Where if you asked any one of us in training, hey, you know, the, the guy who's making sure the, the floors are, are clean from, you know, pathogens, is he any different in moral status is, than you just because you have a, a doctor degree? And everyone would probably say no. And, but yet in, our, in our, the way we conceive of ourselves as, as worthy uh, mm-hmm. and, and, and better or, or less less than good, uh, it, it doesn't match up with uh, you know what we what we would think about others. So I think that's definitely on point. And um, taking a leave is is a very serious thing for uh, a medical student or pre medical student or even a resident or attending. And often what happens is uh, uh, administrators are are a little more risk averse. So mm-hmm. it's a kind of it's a kind of like a first first impulse sometimes when they see a problem sometimes um, inviting a leave or requiring or requesting mm-hmm. a leave, depending on the spectrum of, um, of what is asked for. But the idea that uh, sometimes um, disability is on a spectrum and a necessary accommodation can often bring people back to some level of professional competence that uh, might not necessitate a leave, uh, especially for the, the, the culture for, and the student side or the trainee side is one of, um, um, Essentially, if you lose, if you get off the path, there's something wrong with you, and you're never going back. It's like irreversible failure, and so that's that's on the student side where where that that cultural piece needs to change. But um, um, you, you can easily improve functioning and, and prevent a leave. Sometimes, I, yeah. I think that is such a powerful idea, and I'm going to say it again. And it's even something that I need to start to think about when someone comes to you and they're having a challenge, and, and particularly when you don't even know what it is, one way or another. We need to start to think. Um, let's not think leave first. Let's start to think about, wow, how insightful and aware of you to come and speak to us. Mm. What can, what accommodations or even mm. what resources, what things can we put around you to continue to allow you to achieve? If we, again, it, as long as with this stigma, if, if we consider those coming, asking for either support or even just verbalizing what they're going through as a sign of weakness as opposed to a sign of strength, that is going to be a problem. But instead, if we just start to look at it, and, I, and I'm, I'm saying that very like forcefully on purpose, even for myself, for my fellow deans or administrators out there, we need to not think leave first, because I personally think that that's going to be able to engender a lot of trust in our colleagues if we don't immediately jump to that. Clearly, if a leave is indicated, then a leave is indicated, but that you have a range of options and we should not just automatically jump to that. And we, something that you, you mentioned in regards to uh, culture, we're going to get into this a little bit later in terms of admission and training, but it's so important, this culture of, uh, of changing the culture, making it known that accommodations are available to, for you, making mm-hmm. it known, making it first and foremost that everybody knows that no, our institution believes in this and that we have all of these things there for you. Could you comment a little bit about the accommodation aspect? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> before that, could I ask you a question about like, as sure. a dean, you know, do you, do you notice there's a, um, uh, what do you think on the institutional side creates the incentive to have um, the administrators all with the best of intentions, obviously, to kind of look more towards the leave aspect? Is it well, something you you've know, seen? Well, you know what, uh, Dr. Hawk? Um, 
your, that's why I was so excited about your article. Yeah. You actually hit on many of the points. One, mm. many institutions can be risk averse. All right, that's just the nature of medicine. Set, not, not so much risk averse, just strictly in regards to patients, but risk averse in something negative happening to their, their student or their resident. You know, they, they don't, they think that a leave frequently can be the best thing, it just a, a lot because of the rigors of it. When in reality, if you particularly if you go with our colleagues in undergraduate, like undergraduate just education, they, they really know that taking a student out of their environment can actually be the worst thing for you. Um, mm -hmm. So there's, there's that, that, the risk aversion, protecting the community, but also mainly mm. protecting uh, the, st the student or the resident uh, or the junior or, or, or whichever stage in the career. The other thing is in your article was very, I think very, 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 very dead on, or not dead, correct with this. We don't have the correct trained people set up to handle these situations. Mm. So part of it can be a lack of knowledge and lack of comfort. You talked about that in regards to people wearing dual roles and doing different things. <clears throat> so mm -hmm. there's more factors in that. Um, yeah. But those are two of the major ones. But all of that contributes to what you got at, which was the culture. And then that brings me right back to where we were at with the accommodations. Because if you don't mm -hmm. have people that are really devoted or expert in this where there's a firewall and then you don't have a culture where this is outright known in terms of the communication, the leadership, you're going to have some challenges. So can you tell us mm -hmm. a little bit about like, what, again, just elaborate a bit on what you thought about the accommodations? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, as you mentioned, uh, so the, the person in the institution is called the disability service provider or mm -hmm. um, that, that person is often um, under-resourced first because the institution <laughs> may not be getting around to that uh, financially, but if they do have somebody, it's often somebody who's for the whole university or just for the whole campus, like the whole medical campus, public health, uh, basic science, medicine. But the problem is that this person, first of all, needs to really understand the unique uh, issues that arise in a clerkship um, or in a residency and the way medical uh, curricula evaluate people and the way they organize their uh, trainings. So say I'm a student who has um, some, some issue that arises, um, and I, I go there and I, I say, look, you know, this is what happened and I'm, I'm seeking accommodations. They might say something like, um, okay, so what do you, you know, what should we do? And you might, you know, the student might say, well, that's why I'm here to ask you something about this. Like, I don't really know much about how your, how your cardiology rotation works. So tell me like what, <laughs> yeah. so the, the, the student will often wind up doing a research project on themselves just to get their own <laughs> administrative help. So they, they'll, in addition to their studying and their clinical work, they're going to be emailing a bunch of people and getting forms signed and um, there's, you know, so, so the, the, the disability service provider needs to be specialized in medical education and they also need to uh, not have a conflict of interest in um, evaluating the student in other roles. Um, I've, I've heard a story of, you know, a student who's, um, you know, the person writing their dean's letter was also the one helping them get accommodations. So they didn't really want to tell them the whole story. Um, they don't want to tell them all the details and all the struggles that they really need help with. Um, of course, it's all it's all well-meaning. It's just the, the structures of the way institutions are organized. So there needs to be trust um, and co trust for confidentiality. There needs to be neutrality when it comes to uh, the mediator role. And um, uh, the third thing that often happens is that when a faculty member challenges the accommodation, they are a trained clinician. So their their natural tendency, whenever somebody tells them about a clinical problem, is to say, "All right, let's talk about the differential." Mm -hmm. Tell me your symptoms. Tell me your right. symptoms. You know, let's see if you really have this thing going on. And um, so then, the, the, of course, that's not their role. Their role is to say, okay, we got the letter from you know this person asking for accommodations, just like they would treat their patient uh, mm -hmm. who, when they're writing a letter on their behalf. They would say, listen, you know that you don't have to tell your boss what you're, what's going on. You just have to tell them this is what is my necessary accommodation. Um, but of course, we we want to we want to dig. So. <laughs> Mm -hmm. That's that's a, so disability service provider is very important as a mediary, and um, uh, I think that resonates for a lot of people who've been through the process and tried to get help uh, from, yeah, from no, talking to people. I've heard that. I you not only do I know it resonates, I think it's so powerful. So when we talk about changing that that culture of disclosure or that changing the culture to where people feel more comfortable with disclosing is when I'm when I'm listening to you, Dr. Hawk, I think about those big main pillars, or, or uh, there's many, but I think about um, one, um, how do we actually start to cut into many of these 
unwritten things that are discussed, whether it's the, sto the stoicism, the silent competition, how do we actually start to talk about that? The next thing that I start to think about that you just brought up is how do we actually, if you will, um, make sure that we are forefront and center in regards to mm -hmm. accommodations exist, that we mm -hmm. are known, and this is part of our institution framework. And then the other thing, which is structural. And mm -hmm. uh, by my last reading, 80% um, of everything you can do for wellness is structural. And what you just talked about was a structural, fundamental mm -hmm. structural issue. Resourcing a disability service provider who can actually uh, work with folks in a way in which there's not a conflict of interest, they are knowledgeable, and there's gonna be the last word that you said, which I think is exceedingly important, which gets, at the, at the end of the day, uh, students, residents, physicians, they need to trust their institution. And if you don't mm -hmm. have the trust, that's the basis of any relationship. So I'm with you mm -hmm. on that. Mm -hmm. now, Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And the other thing you mentioned that I thought was great is that, you know, the trust and confidentiality is like double yes. important when it's mental disability, in particular mental illness, because there's the, there's a double stigma. And um, 80, over 80% 80 of the disabilities that students register for are um, men, you know, mental, neurological, psychiatric, yep. psychological. So this is the main issue that disability service providers are gonna face. Okay. The, uh, I, I agreed with all of that. And, I, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to highlight something that you said, and I'm going to give you credit for it every single time that I say it, because it just inspired me. We cannot have students do research projects on themselves. That we, that, that, I mean, that, I'm, I'm taking that, man. You, we cannot <laughs> have students do a research project on themselves to figure out how to get accommodations and what they need. That's, we just, we have to draw a line in the sand. I mean, I'd include residents, I'd include, um, if you will, um, physicians, attendings. Now, for listeners of the podcast, I, we are interdisciplinary. Although I'm speaking about physicians, I personally think that this could apply to any of my colleagues in the health professions. And I do want to, I, I do want to say something before we move on to licensing board issues that I was so glad that Dr. Hawk brought up this idea of moral worth. If the pandemic has taught us anything, it is that our health is in the hands of everybody. There is no, if you will, diva person or whatnot. All of us in a medical center work together, uh, including our mm -hmm. environmental staff, our social workers, our nurses, our PAs, our PTs, our, you know, you name it, everybody. So I'm glad that you brought that up because we, we don't talk about that enough. And uh, I'm, I am a firm believer in that. Mm -hmm. But now, Dr. Hawk, the next part of your excellent article, when I was reading about it, you start to talk about even, let's say everybody gets, you know, we, we get past some of these outright institutional hurdles, all right, in terms of confidentiality, disclosure, and accommodations physicians still face challenges, if we're being honest, some questions in regards to licensing boards. Can you tell us a bit about that, sir? Mm, yeah, this is uh, one of the things I found that was most surprising. Um, so in general, uh, our listeners can imagine that, you know, they're, they're in their school, they're in their training, they're, they're early attending. And every year, every year you get that email saying, would you like, you know, you got to renew your license every three years or whatever it is. And, um, if you look at the if you look at the application, it's a little bit scary because you know you, it's not just your your name and address and do you love being a doctor. It's like, have you ever had this condition? Mm -hmm. uh, have you ever been treated for that condition? Um, are you are you currently uh, you know uh, doing this or that behavior? Are you um, are you able to speak? Are you competent and safe in your practice? Are you oh, so and so you, so the good lawyer will slice through a lot of those questions and and ask. Um, are these violating the Americans with Disabilities mm -hmm. Act or not? Some of them are directly relevant to the practice of medicine and, and they're legal questions like uh, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the ADA standard is that um, anything that's asked about, if it's a current or past diagnosis or a current and past treatment, it has to directly affect their current functional abilities to practice medicine in a safe and competent manner. If it doesn't, if any questions are not about that standard, they're considered illegal. So just slicing things down that way, any question that just said, you know, have you ever met with a psychiatrist? You know, have you ever been on medication for alcohol use disorder, cocaine use disorder, or anything like that? Or any, have you ever, um, basically, have you ever anything that's not directly relevant uh -huh. to uh, what's going on? Uh, would you consider it a violation of the ADA? And then there was a study we cited from 2016 that uh, showed empirically that um, uh -huh. they analyzed all 50 states' um, licensing applications and they found that uh, about two thirds violated the ADA. And not only that, what was really great about this, this paper was um, they showed that in the states that violated the ADA, 
the MDs in those states were also more likely to be not open to seeking care for a mental disorder specific, specifically. So they found a way to connect the policy and structural uh, gaps with uh, the actual behavior of doctors or, or attitudes at least, norms and attitudes. When I read that part, and I look to the audience and listeners, I'll admit, I mean, I don't know if my memory was off or what, but when I read that two thirds, I literally had to, did I miss that? Did Was I not really comprehending that? Because that is that is a legitimate concern. And mm -hmm. we're, we're talking about this, and I'm, I'm focusing on this, not for physicians to not disclose because, oh, look, see what's out there. No, we're doing this so that we can be aware because another point of your paper, Dr. Hawk was that we need to start to advocate in to have these laws actually be enforced in all mm -hmm. of the states. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's the reason to highlight it. So that when we speak about advocacy for physicians that we are aware that this exists and that there are, like this is not legal. So we need yeah. to start to have our, our advocates speak in a way so that we can actually address this. But again, the licensing board issue is relevant. And I think as if you are, again, I'll go put on my hat in terms of an advising dean, or if you're mm -hmm. a residency director, or if you're a mentor, you have to be knowledgeable about that this exists. That should not stop you Though, in terms of, again, as you said before, going with a disability service provider or referring someone to one, or right. if you will, thinking about, okay, how are you going to address it? Because even though this is the case, you do not want to not disclose, but you do, I believe that, you know, knowledge is power. You want to be, you, you want to be aware of it so that you know how to, how, mm, how to work mm. with it. But I have to, yeah, the licensing board issue was, was very, very big. Yeah, I was just going to add to that a little bit and say, um, in some ways, what these clinicians or doctors are doing is very rational. They're saying to themselves, mm -hmm. look, yeah. I know that these physician health programs and these licensing boards are basically, they're more punitive than therapeutic. Mm -hmm. they're, not restore, they're not restorative. They're not looking at the person and saying, how can we bring this person back to uh, functionality and health and integrate them back in? They, 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 that's their intention, I believe, and they're good people. But generally, the, the, the person who has to go into this will... Uh, and there's studies on this that show this mm -hmm. in, in detail, the costs of time and energy, uh, getting a, a lawyer, getting many evaluations, the stress, the clinical appointments, all of that to, and then the, the attitude of one having to defend themselves, you know, uh, yes, I did say yes to this question, but now I'm like on the defense saying, uh, wait, I have to prove that I'm competent and safely able to practice now, as opposed to this having a, um, and, and even though the, the, the board has, Ask me a question that's illegal. Now I'm in. Now the, the clinician is in a position of defending themselves. The other thing is that um, there's no oversight for the licensing boards or PHPs. So they there's been some evidence of conflict of interest for some states, uh, and there's there tends not to be as much parity in mental um, and physical health, and so that that the, the way they're treated is often differently. So um, I believe many states have now had um, uh, there's there's many legal cases out there. Um, that are going through the courts relating to this process. So hopefully things are going to improve, but I, I think, you know, everyone kind of knows it's a problem. Right. Well, I should hope that it will, because if we go back to something that you said earlier, we have people in a place now where they have to search or figure out or do their own research project to figure out how they can get the accommodations that they need. And then now, even if you go through that, there could be a very real possibility that you also would have to kind of figure out how to defend yourself to prove that you're competent even though that was, even though that should not be in question because it's not currently affecting you. So again, I was mm -hmm. being a bit shorthand with that, but if you start to add that up to go back to the term that you use, and I liked it a lot, rational actors, this is what mm -hmm. people face. This is if people are asking, why is there, why, is this, why do people have such concerns in regards to disclosure uh, and confidentiality? This is, this is that reason. And when I speak with people across the learner continuum from UME to GME to fellows to early career psychiatrists, all the way up to senior clinicians, everything that you just pointed out is right there. So Dr. Mm -hmm. Hawk, with that in mind, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. walk us through some of the things that if you had your wish list, if you could, you know, just kind of craft or blueprint mm -hmm. it yourself, what would admissions and training right from the start look right. like in terms of uh, for physicians and disability and accommodations. Right, right, right. I, I would say the most, the, the, the summary would be, let's treat 
uh, our doctors just as we would treat our patients with no less compassion and less um, generosity of spirit and openness, uh, which means we would never advise our patients to just essentially um, sleep more and do more mindfulness to solve uh, these kind of problems. Mm -hmm. They would we, we, would, we would look into the root causes and we would mm -hmm. um, find them interventions that were appropriate to their level of distress or dysfunction. And we would find a restorative approach to their lives. Um, um, and, and, and in detail, that means when people are applying to school, we wanna first be concerned not to lose people in the pipeline. Um, there's been a lot of progress for uh, people who are uh, facing physical disabilities, uh, needing, needing um, accommodations and, and mm -hmm. access to uh, uh, like wheelchairs and, and visual aids and things like that. But in, in terms of um, mental uh, disability, it's still far behind. So in, in admissions, the first thing would be to have clear and inclusive and welcoming messaging mm -hmm. to people so that they know clearly that they're not gonna be penalized for um, advising people. I remember even 10 years ago, one of my part-time jobs was helping people to um, kind of like, there's a pre-med advisor for college mm -hmm. students. And people would often ask me, you know, should I disclose this thing? Should I disclose this diagnosis? And back then, 10, 10 15 years ago, I would always say no. Mm -hmm. I would say, no, 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 definitely don't do that. Because you know why? This whole profession is interested in helping people, but they're not interested in helping you. They mm -hmm. want you to be the person who is, is an exception to all of the rules. Mm -hmm. So um, the first thing would be uh, getting rid of uh, getting rid of the, the fear of being penalized. Number two, I guess, would be uh, making sure that policies for disability access and accommodations and confidentiality are made known so that uh, people know when they're going through their training and their schooling that they, they can get help when they need it. And that, um, the, you know, these people who are struggling with uh, disabilities are, are welcome. They're not just tolerated, but they're actually welcome and they're appreciated because in our um, movements for social justice in medical schools, um, there's been great progress to um, increase opportunity and rectify um, uh, disadvantaged and underrepresented groups. But disability has generally been uh, not included in that as much as it probably should be. And so that's sort of like that kind of messaging and knowledge that like you're not just tolerated, but you're really welcome here. And we, we appreciate your experiences and, and unique way of being in the world. Uh, contact information for your disability service provider should be av available from the beginning. Um, there shouldn't be, uh, the policy should be public. People should know what to expect. Um, just, just like they should know how to get a Dean's letter. Everybody knows mm -hmm. how to get a Dean's letter. Why, should, why doesn't everyone know how to contact their disability service provider and what will happen after they do? It's not that when you send an email, um, a bunch of people you know, in, in suits are gonna come show up and ask you to go to a dark room. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be you know, a normal process that people are not gonna overdo it or underdo it. It's gonna be appropriate, necessary, mm -hmm. careful, confidential. And uh, clerkship requirements, uh, are often not announced in advance. So uh, that will be that needs to be improved also because people who are need accommodations don't even often know what they're going to need them mm -hmm. for. They, they just show up to their clerkship and then all of a sudden there's these things they have to do. And then, then they spend half the clerkship doing the research project on themselves. And, and then it's too late because then three or four weeks go by and they say, what's the point? I didn't learn anything in this clerkship because I was emailing people till three in the morning every night. Um, so I guess that's a summary of training and, and admissions. Yep. Well, Dr. Hawk, you gave us, I, I thought it, I, every aspect of that, I see incredible merit in. I'm looking forward to, and I encourage everybody on this one, look at the show notes because Dr. Hawk just gave us like a really a very nice list of things that we want to consider that we need to look at. And just what it was also the other thing that it was making me think about is there's been a lot of talk in regards to burnout over mm -hmm. the past decade. Um, but a recent study, um, and others have been knowing this for a, a bit of time, is that um, when you look at physician burnout, but then you control or adjust for depression, you actually see that the depression in a recent study, the depression was actually driving the suicide. So when I go back to your original point that, for instance, 1% of uh, medical students with major depressive disorder disclose it as a disability, that's a problem. That we would, as in, in what you just said, treat ourselves as we would our patients. We would not tell any patient to go in and, and not disclose something that could have a significant effect 
on your health. Uh, we just would not mm -hmm. do that. So mm -hmm. Dr. Hawk, I really do feel so you've given us uh, so much information, so um, relevant. Uh, I certainly, I'm not sure when this uh, site cast is gonna drop. Uh, it's, it's one of those where I wouldn't mind having it drop twice uh, for uh, May uh, Mental Health Awareness uh, Month. So, but Dr. Hawk, uh, I wanna thank you for coming on the site cast. Any last words for our audience? Yeah, absolutely. I would just say um, our faculty needs to normalize help seeking as well. It's if you're in a position where you're, um, you know, able to be a model to students, you, it should be normal to say, hey, everyone, welcome to my clerkship. I'm leaving for my uh, weekly, you know, you know, clinician appointment. Um, and you should, too. And you should take your vacation and you should. Um, we should also highlight success stories. You know, this mm -hmm. is this per this person. Um, you know, had this this horrible thing happen to them, and they they made it through 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 the institutional supports. And I think American culture is very individualistic and has a libertarian streak. And because of that, I think uh, it gets human nature wrong. We we are fundamentally interdependent um, and vulnerable. We're not fundamentally mm. individual and invincible. So if you get human nature wrong, you're going to get um, dysfunctional cultures and institutions. And finally, I would just say for people who are in the trenches and struggling. Um, you know, take a look at the AAMC report on disability in 2018, I believe. And then um, for, 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 for deans and, and faculty, get this as a part of your accreditation process. Make it be something that um, can be held with not just um, uh, carrots, but also sticks. And the, the Federation of State Medical Boards has recommended these changes, but has not yet enforced them on these uh, American Disabilities Act questions. So there need to be some enforcement for, for uh, licensing applications. But um, we would also encourage the Department of Justice to issue guidance and ensure uniformity in practice. But ultimately it's gonna come from students and faculty and staff and people who um, get kind of eaten up in the process and have had enough. Dr. Hogg, I want to thank you so very much for appearing on the Sidecast. I certainly would uh, look forward to speaking with you again in the future. Um, you have you have you share with us so many wonderful insights uh, in regards to physicians and disabilities. I'd definitely be very curious to see what uh, other insights that you have in regards to the culture of medicine in the future. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Dr. Norris.